Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 3. We're picking up at the next verse where we left off in Matthew's gospel, but about 30 years have gone by, it turns out, in the, the actual narrative. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Let, let me read it for you. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And this was the John whose birth uh, we read about when, when Kevin read from Luke chapter 1. So he, John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And that's in the passage in Isaiah chapter 40 that Brother Tim read from earlier. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So John the Baptist is now introduced onto the scene in uh, Matthew's account here of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So John the Baptist is the star of the show, so to speak. In terms of John the Baptist, uh, the first thing that Matthew relates to us is his message in verses 1 and 2, his, his message. So once again, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So let's get our, our bearings here. Here's, here's Israel. Um, th this is the Jordan River that flows from the Sea of Galilee to the north down into the, the Dead Sea. And the Judean wilderness where John ministered is probably in this area to the east of the Jordan River. And then um, when people end up going out to him, they're probably going from this, this region. Whoa as well. Remind me to pay our electric bill. <laughs> so that is where John the Baptist was preaching. And then notice the content of his preaching in verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We should talk about that a little bit. Uh, the word Repent is a very important word in the New Testament. It's the word um, metanoeo. And it's made up of a prefix meta, and we're familiar with that metamorphosis, the change in form, and uh, other words, meta, it means change. And the word naeo, which means uh, to exercise the mind, to think. And so literally, you put meta together with uh, naeo, you get a change in understanding, a change in thinking, a change of mind. But as 
we'll see when we get to verse 8, where John says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Repentance is not just an invisible change of mind. It's not just something that happens inside and then there's no correlation with what happens in a person's life. Repentance bears fruit that can be seen in a person's life. Well, what kind of fruit? Well, remember what we saw in Matthew chapter 1? This is the whole uh, um, objective, the whole goal of Jesus. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. This is Matthew 121. For he will save his people from their sins. This mission of Jesus, and John is Jesus' forerunner. We'll, we'll get to that. But this whole mission of Jesus is about saving his people from their sins. John, as Jesus' forerunner, comes preaching a message of repentance. And so repentance is uh, a, a change of mind regarding sin. We, we turn from sin to the Lord, to follow the Lord in newness of life. It's repentance from sin to righteousness. In fact, Lao Nida in their Greek-English lexicon defines the word metanaeo like this. It means to change one's way of life as the result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. That's repentance. It's a change of mind that shows itself in a changed life. And that's the theme of John the Baptist's preaching. And by the way, as we're going to see in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, that was also the theme of Jesus's preaching. Jesus preached the exact same thing, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, let's talk about the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Craig Blomberg, commenting in uh, his commentary, it's an installment in the New American Commentary, he defined the kingdom of heaven this way. The kingdom of heaven depicts the eruption of God's power into history in a new and dramatic way with the advent of Messiah Jesus. So the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, they're synonymous, they're used interchangeably, was anticipated in the Old Testament and it's fulfilled in the New. In the Old Testament, believers were pretty much isolated to Israel and even not all of Israel was saved. And those were the people who obeyed from the heart the kingship of Jehovah. Uh, God has always been the ruler in terms of his providence and sovereignty, but in terms of having willing subjects who loved him and obeyed him, very few in the Old Testament. Well, the Old Testament prophets then um, prophesied about a day when all of the families and all of the nations of the earth are going to know the Lord and uh, their the, the Gentiles are going to call upon the name of the Lord. And in this kingdom, righteousness is going to fill the earth. That's basically foretelling the kingdom of God. And John says the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, it has arrived. It's at the doorstep. And it becomes a major theme from here until the end in Matthew's gospel. And we're, we're going to see, as Matthew writes, that um, this uh, kingdom of God is unfolded to us progressively. So the kingdom of God is at hand. There's, there's a present reality to it. And at the same time, there's a not yet aspect to it as well. It, it's, it's here but it's not all here. And the way I think of it is 
Um, imagine somebody taking a long trip from, let's say, from the East Coast, and they're taking a trip to Mount Whitney because they're going to hike all the way up to the peak of Mount Whitney. And after this long trip across the country, they go up those switchbacks, uh, up, uh, up to the Mount Whitney trailhead, and they park their car, and they go past the Mount Whitney visitor center, and then uh, there's this, this uh, fancy entrance to the trail. Now, I've never gone up all the way to Mount Whitney. I probably never will, but who knows? But I've, I've gone up part way a whole bunch of times. I've, I've gone up as far as most tourists go. And uh, so I'm familiar with that little fancy entry into the trail. And so um, if you're that person that drove from the East Coast to go up Mount Whitney and you park in the parking lot and you start the trail, you, you can say Mount, the, the trek up to the peak of Mount Whitney is at hand. It's here. Well, you're not all the way up to the peak yet. Yeah, but I'm, I'm on the trail. I, it's, it's being unfolded to me as I take each step. I'm getting closer and closer as each step goes by, as each moment goes by. That's sort of like the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. It's here. It was inaugurated with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus describes the nature and character of the kingdom of God in his kingdom parables in Matthew chapter 13. We'll, we'll see that. But the kingdom of God is not all the way here yet. It will be when Jesus comes again. But in the meantime, we're uh, at some point along the road to the peak as if we were hiking up to the top of Mount Whitney. So that's John's message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then Matthew tells us about John's place in prophecy in verses 3 and 4. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Uh, Tim read from that earlier. Let's look at it again. Isaiah chapter 40. I want to point something out to you. Isaiah chapter 40. And verse 1. The quotation is in verse 3. But you'll notice in Isaiah chapter 40 in verse 1, this prophecy that Matthew says, and Jesus says, by the way, as well, which is fulfilled in John the Baptist, it begins with a note of comfort. Comfort, comfort my people, says your Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This is what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to provide the legal basis for God to be able to pardon the iniquity of sinners like us. If it wasn't for Jesus in his righteous life and his uh, substitutionary death on the cross, when he became sin for us, then God would not be able to do this, to pardon iniquity while being holy and just and righteous at the same time. This is why Jesus came into the world. But in preparation for that, on to the scene comes John the Baptist. And so he's the voice in the wilderness crying, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So a couple of things. In your Bible, in verse 3, is the Lord in... Uh, all caps, it's like big caps and then low, small caps. Do you see that? Do you remember what that means? Yahweh, Yahweh thank you. Th that means that in the Hebrew, 
that this uh, passage is translated from, the original Hebrew word is Yahweh for Lord. So think about this. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Whose way did John the Baptist come to prepare the way for? Isaiah says it's Yahweh. Who is it? Jesus or Yahweh? Yes, thank you. That's right. Here's another, another passage that Im implies that Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament in human form. He's Yahweh in the flesh. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Jesus is our God. And then I can't help but point out that God has always done great things in the desert. <laughs> he did in Elijah's time. He did in John the Baptist's time, and he still does it today. God is alive and well in the desert. Amen. Okay, let's pray and then we'll all go home. <laughs> So back to Matthew chapter 3. We're still, we're still working on forgiving you for moving, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Back to Matthew chapter 3. Um, notice verse 4. Whoops, I'm not there. So there's the quotation from Isaiah chapter 40. But now in verse 4, uh, Matthew points out John himself and what he was wearing and what he was eating. And the point is that John's life was a living parable. So listen again to Matthew 3 and verse 4. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So the um, wearing a garment of camel's hair and a le leather belt around his waist, that identifies John the Baptist with the prophet Elijah because that was the prophetic uniform that Elijah wore. Second Kings 1 and verse 8, you could look that up in your own time. It was Elijah's uniform. I was going to show a picture of locusts and wild honey. I decided not to, but it is a very vivid picture of someone holding a book. That's what he ate. John the Baptist ate locusts and wild honey in that Judean wilderness that we saw earlier. And what's, what's the point of all that? John the Baptist was just completely separated from this world. He was totally devoted to the Lord. He had one mission. He had one agenda. He had one master. And he was sent for that purpose. And so he, he preached the word of God and he looked the part. His uh, life and lifestyle were a, a living parable. I want to show you a couple of more passages in Matthew that draw out this connection between John the Baptist and Elijah. So if we look forward, we'll, we'll get to these passages later, but we're going to glance at them now because we're talking about John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 14. In fact, we'll read verses 13 and 14. Matthew 11, starting in verse 13. Jesus said, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So somehow, according to Jesus, John the Baptist is Elijah. Look in chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. 
And notice verses 10 through 13. And the disciples asked Jesus, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? In other words, Elijah must come before the Messiah comes and, and before the end of the age. Jesus answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him but did to him whatever they pleased. And uh, he ends up being beheaded. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So it's not that John the Baptist is the reincarnation of Elijah. The Bible doesn't teach reincarnation. John the Baptist is not literally Elijah, but he came in the spirit of Elijah. He came to fulfill what Elijah pointed forward to. He's the one who came to prepare the way for the Lord. He, he's the one who came to restore all things in preparation for the ministry of the Messiah. That's what his ministry of repentance was all about, this restoration. That's the connection between Elijah and John the Baptist. Um, so John the Baptist fulfills a very important role in biblical history. All right, the next thing we notice in the passage, verses 5 and 6, is his reception by the people. John's reception by the people. Notice verse 5. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Let's just talk about a couple of things here. Um, the word baptized is used in verse 6. Verse 5, there's lots of people going out to hear John the Baptist and to be baptized by him. Uh, but this is the first time baptize, baptism, this concept is mentioned in Matthew's gospel. Uh, baptized is a transliteration of the Greek word baptizo. So there's baptizo, which itself is derived from a Greek root word, bapto. So bapto means to dip into. Baptizo is an intensified form of the verb bapto, and it means to immerse, to submerge. So you don't, just to be clear, you don't pour or sprinkle water onto something, in baptism, baptism is not used that way, but instead you take something and you, sub, you submerge it, you immerse it into, into water or something else, some other medium. That's the idea of baptism. That's just the literal meaning of the word. In Greek and in the English translations in the Bible. And you, you can see why people would be doing that under John's baptism. He's preaching a message of repentance. And people are going out there responding with baptism, meaning they realize they need to repent. They have sins to repent of, which means they have sins that need to be cleansed. They, they have sins that uh, need to be washed Amen. by the Lord. And so that's what they were doing. They were being immersed, submerged in water as a picture of their need to be restored, of their need to be cleansed and forgiven, and pardoned by God. And uh, confessing their sins connects back with Isaiah chapter 40 that we saw earlier uh, with God's mercy. When, when God calls sinners to repentance, it's not 
out of anger. God calls sinners to repentance so that they would turn from their sins to receive his mercy and his pardon and his forgiveness. That's why confession is such a liberating thing. Not that you go and confess to a man, another fellow sinner, by the way. But when you, when you confess to the Lord, oh, it can be public. This was public. But confession is ultimately to the Lord. You say the same thing about your sin as God says. But it's so liberating and it's, uh, it's, it's a gracious thing. Because when you do that, you're not fearing God striking you dead and sending you to hell, but you're confessing your sin to the God of all grace, to the God who pardons the iniquities of sinners like all of us, the God who forgives. And these folks in John's day were taking God at his word and confessing their sins to him. And so there was, there was a marvelous, wonderful reception by the people of John the Baptist. He, don't forget, though, he does end up dead. But at this point in time, there's a, quite a reception. All right, number four his warning. He came preaching repentance. He came as a messenger of God's saving grace, of his pardoning mercy. But he said a lot of things that were warnings. Notice the beginning of verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism. So the Pharisees and Sadducees were two of the main religious groups among the Jews in Jesus' day, in John the Baptist's day. The Pharisees were the religious conservatives. Maybe in recent times, we would think of them as the counterparts of the moral majority. Those were the Pharisees. <clears throat> and the Sadducees were the theological liberals but they were still very religious. And you might think that it was a good thing that these religious leaders, these Pharisees and Sadducees, responded to the preaching of John the Baptist and came out to the Jordan River to be baptized by him. But John saw right through them. He knew that what they were all about. So notice the second half of verse 7 through verse 8. So he saw many of them coming to his baptism. He said to them, you brood of vipers. And in case you're wondering, that's not a compliment. He's basically calling them liars, deceivers, venomous. Who warned you to flee from the wrath of to come. Then he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. These Pharisees and Sadducees were not among the people in the crowd confessing their sins, supposedly, because they weren't repentant. They thought of baptism as another rung in their ladder as they attempted to climb their ladder to heaven, as they attempted to earn their salvation, it was just another religious rite, another religious ceremony, just another thing that good religious people do in order to go to heaven. That was the attitude of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. By their works... By being baptized, they're fleeing from the wrath to come. And that's why John says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
The Apostle Paul included this characteristic of repentance in his own preaching. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 20, you can turn there with me. Acts 26 and verse 20. Here Paul is giving his testimony before King Agrippa. And in chapter 26 and verse 20, he says he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent, same word, metaneao, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. So repentance is not doing good deeds. Remember, it's a change of mind, a change of attitude. But then there's, there's fruit. The fruit of repentance is uh, doing deeds in keeping with their repentance. And in the case of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the fruit in keeping with repentance for them would have included a humble attitude. They, they weren't the ones who were out there committing notorious sins, at least out in public. Who knows what they did behind closed doors. But they had a proud, self-righteous heart. They thought more highly of themselves than they ought. They, they did their religious deeds in order to be seen by other people. They looked down their noses at others. That's what they needed to repent of. That um, would have been, if they would have turned away from that, that would have been fruit in keeping with repentance. That's what John was calling them to. But John wasn't finished with them. Back in Matthew 3 and verse 9, really lays on the warnings and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. This is a persistent theme among the Jews, particularly the Jewish religious leaders in John's and Jesus' day. They thought they were okay in God's sight because they were the physical descendants of father Abraham. Surely, surely God would not punish the physical descendants of Abraham. Surely I don't need to repent. I don't have any sins to confess because I have Abrahamic DNA in my blood. That's what was going on in their hearts. How does John answer them? For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. It is not physical relationship or descent. It's not whose DNA you share in your family line. It, that wasn't the case for the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Wasn't even the case for John the Baptist himself. It was never the case that people go to heaven on the basis of their bloodlines. Grace does not flow through blood. Grace comes through faith in the salvific provision of God. We know that he has a name, Jesus. Under the old covenant, they knew this savior through the types and shadows of the Old Testament system. But saving grace is not transferred from one generation to the next through bloodlines. And this is a really important point. So I want to show you some other scriptures just in case, um, I don't know. I want to drive the point home. Look in John chapter 1. Well, the Bible drives the point home. It's this is a repeated theme. Amen. And it's a common temptation. 
So in John chapter 1, verse 11, this John is not John the Baptist. This is the Apostle John, by the way. He's the same author who wrote uh, this gospel, also 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. And here, as he begins his gospel, he writes, chapter 1, verse 11, that Jesus, who is the Word, the eternal Word of God, he came to his own, his own people according to the flesh, the Jews, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Now listen to this from John. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. No flesh, nothing material, nothing physical contributes to our salvation and our relationship with God. John chapter 8 and verse 39, Jesus said to another group of Jewish religious leaders, leaders, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. And finally, Paul, Romans 2, verses 28 and 29, for he is not a Jew who, who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. This is a very important point. John is emphasizing to these Jewish religious leaders that it is not um, physical descent that God is looking for. It is the heart of Abraham, the faith of Abraham. In fact, you are a child of Abraham if you have faith in Jesus. The New Testament explicitly says that. So reading on in verse 10, here's more of this theme of judgment. Even now... The axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's a very, very powerful image of judgment. And basically, John the Baptist is saying that even as the kingdom of heaven is here, it is at hand. So there is judgment that goes along with it. There is mercy and grace and salvation to all who, who trust in the God of the kingdom, who embrace through faith the salvation that is freely offered in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but to those who refuse, to those who harden their hearts, there's judgment. And frankly, there's a lot of commentators who see in verse 10 a, a warning of judgment towards physical Israel. Those whom the Sadducees and the Pharisees represent. Remember the figure of the olive tree in Romans chapter 11. And here a, a tree is being used again. And uh, this tree representing physical, the physical descendants of Abraham, it's not producing fruit. It's not receiving her Messiah. And so judgment is awaiting her. Verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. And there he's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He was the forerunner of the Messiah. John's ministry was not about himself. He was pointing the way to Jesus. Jesus. 
And in John's gospel, John records John the Baptist's words when some of his own followers said, John, what do we do? Because more people are going to Jesus. And John the Baptist says, that's why I'm here. I must decrease. And he, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he must increase. And what an example John the Baptist is to us. There's no place for pride and ownership and competition and arrogance in the kingdom of God. Don't think to yourself, that's my ministry. As if it's your side business. We're all servants of Christ. It's all about him. We, we have no rights. It's not about our glory and our fame. Everything is of him, through him, and for him. And so if somebody else is doing a similar ministry to, to me or to you in this church or any other church, then praise God. Jesus is being served. The, the kingdom is being helped. Her borders are being extended. I must decrease and he must increase. So Jesus, mightier than John, John says at the end of verse 11, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when those um, original disciples, the 120 or so, um, who constituted the Christian church at that time, they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. They, they were immersed in his power. And from that time forward, all believers at the time of conversion are baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's coincident with our new birth, when we are born of the Spirit. We're, we're born again, and the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us, and he regenerates us, gives us a new heart. Uh, he puts the law of God in our heart and, and in our minds. He adopts us as God's children. He uh, sanctifies us and begins the process of sanctification. That is all part of the package of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. We have this baptism of the Holy Spirit, however you want to describe it. It's, there's mystery to it, for sure. But we have this in greater measure than any believer in the Old Covenant. Pick a believer in the Old Testament. Abraham, David, Moses. We've talked about uh, Elijah, none of them had the Holy Spirit. None of them was baptized with the Holy Spirit like we are, every single believer in the new covenant. The Holy Spirit was there imparting gifts, causing dead sinners to be born again, yes, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament sense started with Jesus. And John the Baptist was alluding to that. But then there's more judgment, in verse 12. His winnowing fork is at hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. So here he's using the metaphor of uh, separating out the wheat from the chaff and basically you, you have a big pile of harvested wheat, the whole thing, which we have no engagement with. I mean, all we do is take whole wheat bread and pop it in the toaster. But that comes from someplace. And so they have a heap of harvested wheat seed, I guess you can call it, or grain. And uh, they would have a winnowing fork and they'd throw the whole thing up in the air 
one scoop at a time, and the wind would blow the chaff out of the way, and then the, the heavy part, the actual seed, would, would fall to the ground. Doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. But uh, John is using this as a metaphor for judgment. In other words, this is what God is doing. God is the harvester. God is the farmer. And God is the one who's uh, harvested these wheat seeds into his barn and onto the threshing floor. And what, what is God doing? He's, he's looking for the real thing, for the genuine article, uh, the actual fruit that is nutritious and, and good for us. And the chaff is of no use. And farmers would typically burn the chaff just to get rid of it. It just, just takes up space and room. It's a hassle to try to keep. So you just burn it. And that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's the threat of this judgment from God. Unquenchable fire. In the human realm, when chaff is burned, it eventually burns out. But in God's realm, when God sends a sinner to hell, the fire burns as an unquenchable fire. That's the threat. That's the warning. All who do not repent, all who do not confess their sins, all who do not trust in the God of the Bible, ultimately, eventually, will be cast into unquenchable fire. But here's the good news. Today is not that day. There's coming a day. It has, um, we, we, we all die once. It's been appointed for us all to die once and after this comes judgment, Hebrews 9.27. And then there is coming a day when Jesus is going to come again and he will judge the living and the dead and those whom he doesn't know, those who are not his sheep, those who have not repented, he will cast into the lake of fire. But again, that's not today. Today, the Bible calls the day of God's mercy, the day of grace, the day of salvation. In fact, the reason why there continue to be days between this moment and the moment when Jesus either comes or calls is because God is still saving sinners. He's still powerfully calling sinners to himself for salvation. And there's, and there's no other purpose. Every other purpose for life to continue is subservient to that grand purpose of God's sal salvation. And so today, today, you can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. You don't have to go to Israel, to the Jordan River, and be baptized by John the Baptist, who is no longer there. You don't have to go anywhere else. You don't have to do anything special and noteworthy. All you have to do is in your heart of hearts, call upon the name of the Lord. Trust in the Lord Jesus, whom uh, John the Baptist prepared the way for. Jesus died on the cross for sinners like you. He paid the penalty for your sins and my sins. And he was raised from the dead for our justification so that we can have a right standing before God. And the simple requirement is, is faith, trust, trust in him. Trust in Jesus today and he will save you. And not only will you never touch this unquenchable fire, but Jesus will give you the gift of eternal life from the moment that you believe. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for John the Baptist and we thank you especially for Jesus.
whom he pointed the way to. We pray, Lord, that you will help us in our lives to bear fruit worthy of repentance. And we pray that you would grant repentance to many uh, who maybe don't know you yet. Lord, please save sinners today through your word, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.